We've seen a, a sharp spike in uh, e-cigarette use, youth, um, use among uh, minors over the last year from 2017 to 2018. So um, youth use, so kids use, has increased 77% among high school students and over 50, around 50% among middle school students. These really are reaching cool. epidemic type of proportions in terms of the number of youth that are now using e-cigarettes. When all the data comes in, we're going to be publishing it next month. Um, it's going to look like around 20% of American kids are using e-cigarettes and probably almost a third are using some form of tobacco products. There's really no good news in this report. This is from the National Youth Tobacco Survey um, because even while e-cigarette use is increasing, so is the use of combustible tobacco products as well. So there's no good news here. So we have to step in with forceful action and try to reverse these kinds of trends. You said at that point when uh, we, we first spoke about this with you that, that you were waiting to hear from the industry to hear what some of their ideas might be. But then, uh, in pretty quick order, we heard about this raid on Jules' offices. What, what happened? Why well, did you do that? Well, we're collecting more information, and that was part of our effort to collect information. There's going to be other efforts we take to gather information. We've now met with Jewel. I met with Altria and Reynolds as well in the last couple of weeks. Um, and we've had good discussions, and they put some good ideas on the table. I think we have a sense of where we're going to be heading with what we're going to do from a policy standpoint. Um, we have a problem with access. These products are too accessible to kids, and we have a problem with appeal. These pro products are too appealing to kids right now. And it's mostly the cartridge-based um, e-cigarette products. The open tank products that you might find at a vaping store aren't generally used by kids. It's these cartridge-based products that are being used by the kids. So we're going to take steps to restrict access to these products among minors, um, some further steps. And we're going to take steps as well to, to reduce their appeal. And that's going to mean some, some restrictions on the flavored products. It's really the flavored products that are driving the youth use. They're the most popular products among kids. We'll, we'll talk about some of those steps in a moment. But again, why this raid on Juul? I, I realize that uh, their product is one that's being used pretty heavily. But y you must have thought that they weren't being forthcoming in some of their answers if you actually went to the extent of, uh, of this raid of trying to find out what was happening behind closed doors. Well, it's not that unusual for us to conduct inspections and gather documents around uh, manufacturing marketing practices. So um, this is something we do. It's probably something we're going to do um, in other cases in this, in this space as well. Um, we have to get a sense of how these products are being marketed. We also sent letters to around 20 manufacturers last week asking them to come forward with information to demonstrate that their products are being lawfully marketed. So in order to be lawfully marketed, you had to be on the market um, before August of 2016. So we don't have evidence that all these products were on the market before that, that so-called you know, deeming date. Um, and so we're going to be gathering information to, to prove whether these products are or not lawfully marketed. So there might be other inspections as we go through um, and try to determine whether all these markets are on, all these products are on the market legally. I've, I've long thought uh, that denials from some of these companies uh, to try and keep it out of the hands of the youth has have been kind of um, something I didn't believe, just because of the many flavors that are out there. Um, what did you find? Well, we're still going through the documents if you're um, talking in reference to Juul. Um, we're going to be putting out data very soon, looking specifically at them, at the scope of their sales that now are legal sales to kids. Um, I think it's going to be a very big number um, of their total sales. I mean, clearly that, that's driving a lot of the youth use, but it's the other products as well. Um, but, the, you know, some of the products are more popular, more appealing to kids right now than others. You know, but it, the, the reality is that if it, it's one product today, it's going to be another product a year from now. So we really have to treat this as a market segment, look at all the products, and look at the features that are making these so appealing and so accessible to kids. And that's where we're going to be taking action. All right, I want to bring up a statement from Juul. We brought it quickly up on the screen, but I'd like to bring it up again, make sure that they have a chance to have their say. Juul says, we are committed to preventing underage use, and we want to engage with FDA, lawmakers, public health advocates, Advocates and others to keep Juul out of the hands of young people. You just said you think it's a, a, a significant portion of their sales are to minors. What, what, what tells you that? Well, our own analysis, we're going to put that out. Um, we've done various analysis. We have access to various surveys of the market um, on how many kids are using different products. Next year in the National Youth Tobacco Survey, there's going to be an explicit question in that survey. We put it in. Um, asking about which product kids are using. So we're going to know exactly from that survey, and that survey is going to be in the field in early next year, exactly how many kids are using various branded products. So we'll know how many kids are using Juul. Um, we think the figure actually might be underreported because some kids, when you ask them if they use these cigarettes and they're using a Juul product, they refer to it as Juuling, as you know. You probably heard that mm -hmm. term. Um, and they don't consider it an e-cigarette. So we think we're not capturing the full scope of kids that are using it. But next year we'll have an accurate read. There's another uh, survey that's going to be coming out soon. And we're doing our own survey of the market to get a sense of exactly how many kids are using different products. We think it's going to be a high number. Um, our estimates right now that we're in possession of, and we'll be publishing them soon, show a pretty high number. 
last time you were with us, you suggested that one way of trying to prevent these sales would be stopping them from being allowed to be sold online, where no one can check to see if somebody actually has an actual ID before they purchase. Is that uh, something that is more likely at this point, given what you've found so far? Well, I think it's more likely. It's more likely that we're going to put some restrictions on how they can be sold online if we continue to allow online sales. We'll have to do that through regulation, but we could potentially ban online sales until those regulations are in place. Most of these products are actually still sold through brick and mortar stores. I think we're looking at what can be sold in brick and mortar stores and whether or not the flavors should be sold in, you know, regular stores or in a 7-Eleven or, or, you know, a truck stop or gas station, or whether if, if there are flavored products on the market, they should be confined to adult-only vaping shops, um, which generally do a better job of checking ID. Uh, a lot of the sales that we've seen going to minors are actually happening in the brick and mortar stores, you know, the convenience right. stores. Uh, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, a couple things. You, you mentioned this idea that kids don't even think that they are smoking e-cigarettes. And, you know, you go online right now, even just their own website, this is the Jewel website, calls it the smoking alternative. Unlike any e-cigarette or vape, people don't even think it's, it's a vape or an e-cigarette the way, the way they're marketing these things. Would you ever support the kind of labeling that they have, not just in the U.S. on regular cigarettes, but on the, on, in, in the U.K.? I mean, you've, you've seen yeah. those labels. I mean, those, those are pretty aggressive labels in terms of saying what can happen to you uh, if you, in fact, engage with this. Look, there's, there's labels right now that warn about the addictive quality of nicotine. Look, we, we, we've taken accommodations. Last year, we took some accommodations to extend application deadlines on these e-cigarette products to allow them to stay on the market because we, we recognize them as a viable alternative for adult smokers who want to get access to satisfying levels of nicotine without all the harmful effects of combustion. These can be modified risk um, products, but they need to be put through an appropriate regulatory process. We're doing that. Um, and there's also no free lunch here. Um, these products, while probably safer than smoking, and if we can switch every adult smoker to an e-cigarette, it would have a profound public health impact. Um, there's no free lunch. The, there are risks associated with these products, but certainly in a setting of kids where you're addicting them to nicotine, potentially a lifelong addiction to nicotine, that's something that we can't tolerate. And that we now have data that shows that a proportion of people, kids, who become addicted to nicotine through these cigarettes are going to migrate onto combustible tobacco. That's why we're so concerned about this.